Hey folks, welcome back. Recently, I told folks on my community tab that I would be returning to reviews. I always really loved reviewing decks and often, especially because I own more decks, so it sometimes takes a little longer or it just depends what's going on in my world, life, etc. Um, they're not new shiny decks anymore. This is a deck that has been around for a very long time. It seems to be getting a another wave. I don't even want to say a second wave. It's probably like a fifth wave at this stage. It has become, I, I feel it's safe enough to say it's kind of a cult classic, would people agree? I freaking love this deck and I really love the artist Will Worthington. Also, he is mentioned several times throughout the guidebook. So before we even dive into thoughts, feelings, experiences, that's a really high point for me. But yeah, we're getting into reviewing. My reviews are long, they're rambly, they get into how I experience, feel, perceive, use the deck. Of course, through that, I'll be sharing some information, just snippets from the book, and we'll go through all of the cards. So, spoiler, if you don't want to see all of the cards, we are going to do that in here. And for my reviews at the moment, what seems to be working is putting them back in order still. So I've done that for you. So first, let's get into the book. And hopefully this filming angle is okay. I have overhead lighting. My lighting situation is not going to improve because I can't... <laughs> I don't have the financial means at the moment to improve it. But of course, once we get past this shiny cover, it's not going to be a problem. I'll give you a, a little view of the contents page quickly. Of course, I don't want to give away too much of the contents as well. So we're going to jump to the pink bits <laughs> and my chaotic frame of referencing. But here is the contents for anyone who's curious. It's a very, very well-rounded guidebook in my opinion. This isn't a regurgitation of previous tarot meanings. Means as this doesn't adhere solely to a set system, it's not going to do that anyway but more so it's very much the creator's expression of tarot, his experience of tarot, his relationship with the environment, his beliefs, his approach. It's a very environmentally conscious kind of ecology infused smattering in here, which I feel like would be a given with the Wildwood, but just in case. Aside from introducing you to the deck and this new iteration of it for those who had had the Greenwood Tarot, it also introduces you to just a little bit of the ethos of the creators, their vision. It takes you through the way that they have mapped out the cards and you get this Wheel of the Year, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And then after the cards, who all get a really fair exploration there. but you also get to finding your way working with the cards and there is another second journey opportunity which I'll talk to you about as well the passion that Mark Ryan has does come through there's a lot of human history included in some of the initial write-ups like I said environmental discussions ecological changes and these are infused in some of the meanings as well so this deck does have an agenda um, but to me that makes sense when decks have an agenda it means that they're fully infused by their theme you know this isn't just a deck of pretty pictures that are take you know taking you a walk through the wild they are actually representative of bigger discussions um, aspects that whilst it might not look like it visually are actually speaking to where we are modern day as well as where we've come from in the past i i just respect that to be honest i don't tire of it as i feel it's in keeping with the vision and i do tire of the traditional you know quote unquote depending on what system you're using box meanings very quickly because i've personally studied them enough so i find this to be quite a breath of fresh air but don't expect to fall comfortably into a system where 
you recognise the keywords because there are keywords on the cards and some of them are not Thoth and they are not Rider Waite Smith and they are their own thing and yeah it's a it's a big bonus point for me but it might not be for you. In the write-ups that Mark Ryan does he's really giving you an idea of where he comes from, he's very passionate um, very occasionally it reads a little bit more like a self bio in my opinion I do find myself leaning towards John Matthews writing style a tad more but as I say I can only really differentiate between the initial contents it's undeniably Mark's baby even with all the collaborative stuff so one of the things that I really love about this section which is why I have pinpointed it is it talks about question structures there's this really important note here about how answering a question through tarot, a lot of that relies heavily on the process of creating and crafting the right question, which can be really difficult for beginners or just perhaps if you're in the thick of a moment and you've decided you still want to read for yourself. But again, it's very hard to craft that and I feel like this was just a very thoughtful discussion that I don't see a lot of in guidebooks and something that personally is interesting enough as an intermediate or a pro or whatever you want to call yourself but also very beneficial for a beginner. This is going to be out of context but it continues in the question bit and it is just something that I, I couldn't help but love. It's one of my favourite parts of the whole entire book, actually, especially as a therapist, especially as getting to the crux of um, the realities beneath what we're saying, beneath what we think we're talking about sometimes as well. And it says here, it's a great piece. <laughs> it's often said that people argue over whether a loved one has left the top off of the toothpaste. When the real issue is often a more basic question, such as, do you still love me or are you seeing someone else? I know that some people might hear that and be like, what? But I really just would invite people to sit with it and perhaps just begin with the first part. Do you still love me? And it, this is a very sort of like domestic example, isn't it? But if someone's continuing to leave the toothpaste off and their partner has discussed it with them beneath the irritation of you know, why do you keep leaving the toothpaste top off when we've spoke about it? Do you still love me? It kind of traverses an experience with phobias when there's a discussion that all phobias, um, whether it be a, a phobia of spiders, whether it be a phobia of aeroplanes, uh, claustrophobia, that it all innately boils down to a fear of death. And so upon hearing that, sometimes it's quite hard to wrap our head around the concept because it's a very bold statement. But when we really get into it, and that's what it says, in asking questions of the Wildwood Tarot, go within yourself, get to the heart of the question and ask it in a simple and profound manner. So this is just a part of the question asking process that when I was reading it I, I literally had a chef's kiss moment I, I freaking love it overall in terms of an introduction it it's it's offering quite a lot aside from the Mark Ryan sort of bio -y bit which again it's his deck so and then we get to the wheel of the year which is based on the northern hemisphere so you're gonna have to work with this a little bit if you're in the southern hemisphere I would really recommend working with this. Um, of the two workings, major workings that are suggested in this deck, this is my, it's not my most favourite, but it is very helpful. There was some critique about this deck a while back that this is the way that they structured the majors but that the majors still run in the usual order from the fall all the way through to the world. I actually think that that's a really powerful thing that this book did in particular in this deck because it's not confusing the layers there and slowly over time if you read this and you work with this my experience even like I said as someone with a very now foggy memory especially short term it tends to start infusing the deck and I don't feel that it was meant to force upon us a new major arcana. Anyway, that's not how I experience it. It's more that the the walk through the seasons and the wheel of the year and this 
presence with the tides and the seasons and the elements is very much intrinsic to the deck's nature. And so what they've done is they've kindly given us the wheel of the year through the wildwood. It may also help you or even encourage you to notice the seasons that are being depicted in some of the images, some of the animals that are going on there, you know, the weathers. I will say that, of course, uh, alongside this being Northern Hemisphere, it feels very much infused in uh, a British landscape or at least vastly sort of a European landscape. Speaking as a Brit, everything in this deck is, is something that I'm familiar with and the animals either live here now or were native to Britain at some point. So I, I just want to put that out there as well. I have journeyed through this. I have laid it out a few times and I tell you my experience is that it really just added another layer of depth to this. It also has a very interesting concept about how we begin as the fall, which in here is called the wanderer. I'm pointing over here, you can't see it. And then once we've gone round this, once we move into the shaman and the seer i can't remember if that's considered like a joint process or one after the other and eventually we get to the world tree and it's like this really cyclical process and to me just i suppose it's quite complementary to my practice i do work with a sabbath the splitting of eight does fit with my practice and whilst i don't necessarily work with them in a in a structured capacity anymore. I do I do still acknowledge the Sabbaths on the set days, like mentally, even if I don't celebrate them then, because that's that's just something that I'm used to in my process. We're going into the meanings. One of the things is the suits have different names by the by but also there's this weird space in this deck where sometimes it feels a lot more Rider Waite Smith than others and some they go completely rogue. I think that's why this deck throws a few people because as soon as they see the Rider Waite Smith familiarity, they dive into that and it's not going to save you. <laughs> it's really not. I just assume based on the very Rider Waite Smith-esque, uh, like I said, not regurgitations, but definitely familiarities, when they do follow in its footsteps, the suit of arrows and the air element to me is still the sword. It's like the bow is the embodiment of the action and the arrow is the the communication of that. And uh, just so you can see then, here is here's what the arrows look like. The courts are animals. This is one of my greatest joys. So I can only tell you my experience of this being very fulfilled by the fact that these are animals because aside from all of the animal work that I do, Sometimes, even though the courts are, to me, an embodiment of certain actions, personality types, maybe even professions and, you know, parts of our life, I find it somehow easier to do it with animals. And I honestly don't have any rhyme or reason for you other than if you think about we all think in different ways, we have different um, ways of remembering things, like I said, with the arrows and the bows. And to me, that's kind of the language that my brain speaks in terms of archetypes. And it's not that I don't recognise the animals to be highly multifaceted either. So I don't get why the human presentation is just less appealing to me, but it is. You arguably can pick it up and just read it out of the box. Um, but if you don't know anything about animals, you're going to either have to read the rest of the imagery or come to the book or rely on what you already know about the cults. Um, all of those fine options. We've got the meaning here, the reading points as a person in your life, as an aspect or a process, as an event slash happening questions. Sometimes they do really well in uh, not gendering these discussions. Other times they just go straight in for a gender. Uh, so it, it's a mixed match. It's kind of made clear that it's not meant to be gendered in a way that removes it from other people. But if you were using animals anyway, it feels like a missed opportunity. It will tell you what the animal is, which is, as far as I'm concerned, always important if they're going to use it in this capacity. 
and a little bit about it. I think that that's helpful. It feels like enough as far as I'm concerned. And then if you're an animal nerd like me, you can get right into it on the internet or in the books or whatever, library. And if you're not, it feels like it's enough to, this is why we picked Kingfisher. But in my experience, there's always, even in an amazing book, a couple of meanings or a moment when you're like, what? <laughs> and then here, we're just gonna give you an idea of one of the miners. And you can see that the miners have keywords on them. So I did mention the keywords, right? Uh, this one is spark of life. Then we get a description. So it still talks about what you're seeing in the imagery. And this is why I know that Will Worthington and uh, Mark and John got together and produced something very thoughtful indeed, because the inclusions are very intentional. Then you've got the meaning, which is always the short part, because then you get into the reading points. The re That's predominantly it for this book, other than the back bit. Uh, you do have spreads, of course, of course. And then we have a walk in the wildwood. And this is the this is my favourite bit. Now, the walk in the wildwood is how many pages long? One, two three four pages long and this bit is the introduction discussion so this is the introduction before you actually get into the journey which is three pages it's not a lot they call this a visualization i've often called it a meditation a journey honestly a lot of these words are interchangeable and it's more to do with what it means to you and the process this doesn't do what the Wheel of the Year does. This is something that they created together to take you through the major arcana and the cults in a, in a meeting where you traverse the woods and you come across them one by one. It's so fascinating. It's incredibly brief considering how many cards you're going through. It still manages to help paint a picture. Now, what I wanted to do was just give you some maybe hints and tips based on my experience because, of course, this is a written piece, which means you're required to read it. It says, find a comfortable spot to lie down and relax and play some gentle music in the background. I love all of this invitation, but the one thing it doesn't say in here, which is probably a given for most people, is that if the reading process is going to hinder you, which I would imagine for a lot of people it would. I have done one of these through just reading it and it was still really interesting. But in the end, I recorded myself reading it out loud and then played it back just on my phone, nothing fancy, with, yes, some, uh, some of my preferred music in the background, which was probably either nature sounds or drumming. I've done it a few times. Um... And just listen to that. It's not the best listening to your own voice. It would be great if there was a pre-recorded one from them. But they put a lot into the deck. So, you know, <laughs> that's probably me being greedy. But I highly recommend that for those who, who really want to immerse themselves in it. The idea as well is to envision uh so it could be fun to do this before you've even used the deck if you happen to be someone who hasn't already used it and that's of course if you're a visual person and we'll get to that as well but if you are a visual person and you want to do like the more meditative journey work then definitely record it and listen back to it give yourself some ambience i found it to be really really interesting now, they say don't use the cards because they want you, like I said, to have a visual experience of your own of these characters. But, of course, some people don't have a, a visual mind. They don't see pictures and things like that in their mind. You may very well do the journey and have other sense experiences and perhaps that's the way you want to do it. 
But one of the things that I wanted to suggest, and I have tried this just to then be able to talk about it, is to simply, if you don't, use the cards. And as you're listening to it, which definitely means you can't read it, simply the the wanderer is us anyway so they're not really the representation of anything we meet uh, so you could even pick a different card or you know what you look like right but just then pull the cards out as you're meeting them to aid that process if the description isn't going to bring something that you feel would spark a journey sensation or just really add value like if it's not going to add value why would you do it so I do think there is um, definitely a really great way to do it I have tried it I still found it really interesting it is another way of working with this just in terms of trying to have some accessibility um, of course for the hearing impaired that then is more of a challenge I would imagine that if you're okay with reading, taking a pause, being with either the image in your mind or again the card, then there's that as well. I freaking loved it. I have, I've had visions of some of them. Some of the other characters felt far more abstract or like the, the cults as animals. I could envision them doing various behaviours that I even know they do or that I've witnessed them do in in real life. Yeah, it's I, I really enjoy it. It's fun. I will do it again. I get something from it each time. Sometimes certain characters stand out for me. Sometimes it's just a really nice, peaceful process. But it is one of my favourite things to do. And when I spoke to people about journeying through the Wildwood, I think a lot of people thought that I had a year in the Wildwood. Um, and I don't. I know very little about that book and I can't comment on it. I hear good things. I'm sure that there'll be some reviews of the process at the end of 2023, if there's not already something on YouTube. But this is actually what I was talking about. A walk through the Wildwood alongside doing the weird of the year i honestly i couldn't recommend it more so all in all it's a it's a great book i really like it and for any of the parts that just don't resonate with me water off of a duck's bank right <laughs> it's i'm gonna say overall seems to be inoffensive it hasn't offended me but obviously I cannot speak for everyone and I have found it to be a particular treat in terms of guidebooks. It's one that I've actually used other than just reading. So we're going to get into the cards now because wow that was a long discussion but that is my genuine review of the book and I could review it as a solo thing so <laughs> that is how I approached it. I think that the book is it's worthwhile. If there's ever a book that doesn't really need reviewing, then I wouldn't do that whole spiel. It was too much of an opportunity. Uh, the only other things I think that I would add is that, like I said, there's a lot in the imagery, and we'll get into this in the deck anyway, where things feel symbolically important or relevant. So animals, artefacts, monuments, like I said, the time of the year, sometimes the place. They all have a meaning, sometimes folklore, sometimes a messen messenger or medicine attached if it's an animal. So I think that there's a there's a big invitation from that book. But that being said, perhaps you skipped and the book isn't of interest to you and you just wanted to get into the deck, seeing how long the book discussion was. So that is what we're going to do. Uh, just for the people that care about it, the cardstock is UV laminated as far as I understand it. And honestly, this deck has been absolutely, oh, I mean, abused doesn't sound like a very nice term. So loved. It's been used and loved. And look at it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe me if I told you that, right? It's in such good condition. It's been outside, it's been in the rain. I mean, it has bowed, um, but only mildly. It's a nice cardstock. I like it. I'm happy with it. Medium thickness. <laughs> that's, that's as good as you're going to get out of me. Before we start flipping through the cards, one of the things I wanted to say as well is that there are some cards that there are tyres drawn between. Either perhaps purposefully 
well, I imagine it all to be purposeful, but some are more obvious than others. If I can remember some of them, I'll try and keep them out. I know that we see the Wanderer in another card and it makes sense in terms of the Wheel of the Year in the book as well. So that's kind of cool. It just, again, it's like, oh, it adds that extra, extra layer. And I really love that. Some of them are mentioned in the book as well, but some of them are not. So that is our Wanderer. And I really love that they're facing away from us, by the way. Um, then we have our Shaman. A lot of renames in this. So this is the Magician. And we have our Seer, who is the High Priestess. Very in keeping with the deck's theme. We've not got two random pillars because it would just not make any sense. You know, it is far more far more earthy. There does seem to be some, like I said, some shamanic ties into it. We've got Sheila and the Gig on the front of this cauldron as well so there's a lot to see if you stop and start looking at the little images and spending time with perhaps one card which i love to do as well with this deck who she's mixing into the cauldron um i don't know if this is someone particular on on the green man's cauldron by the by but we've got another animal and we've also got this image which comes up later in the deck and i can't remember for the life of me what it's called but it is um it is a real thing <laughs> and I can't remember what it's called of course so I'm going to pop that one to the side as well we've got the ancestor instead of the hierophant which is one of the cards that led me to fall in love with this deck and you can see that this is very wintry so we know in the wheel of the year that this isn't set in summer already just right off the bat and that's why I said it's it's a very interesting thing to look at. I love this hand fasting. It obviously, it kind of is still love centric, but most lovers cards are. And uh, the, the idea of options and pathways and decision making and choices for me is still very much there. And then we've got the archer here instead of the chariot which is when you first get into the ones where I think they've really changed up some of the symbology. Although I suppose the green man and green woman don't really look like the emperor and empress. But, yeah. In this deck, the stag, which <laughs> it took me a while. Um, in fact, let's get... It took me a while with these two. Because to me, they both look like they could be strength cards. But actually, the Woodward is strength and the Stag is justice. It speaks about it very eloquently in the book. Um, and we've got the, I feel like, the Tree of Life and some other imagery going on here that definitely, definitely lends itself towards the concept of justice. But I definitely remember them being the two hardest ones to define in the whole entire deck. And we've got the Hooded Man. And probably one of my favourite wheels in all of the decks. Because it doesn't look like it's on a game show for a start. <laughs> it feels much more fitting and in line with seasonal wheels you know changing tides it's still got a physical wheel imagery we've got weaving i don't know if this would technically be called weaving but we're going to call it that because it's my video <laughs> is this a loom i don't know i just love the inclusions here these three herons chilling out in the background i feel like it's a very thoughtful card and like i said i find myself wanting to spend a lot of time in these cards so the mirror is the hanged one and you've got this kind of serpent type siren and I freaking love the concept of the mirror for the hanged one. I have done a lot of workings with this card in particular. I don't want to push too much of like my own agenda onto this card for other people so I'll probably leave it there. Uh, but also notice there's kind of, I always register this as a corpse in the background if I'm honest, but there is this kind of, they've, they look like they've been wrapped 
like that chrysalis thing going on there as well. Um, and we've got a heron here again. To me, they feel important in this card. Herons will sit and watch the water in almost like a mirror, like a reflection for a very long time whilst they're hunting or whilst they're resting before hunting. And so to see a heron peer into a pool of water is not unusual at all. And then, of course, you've got the, the lovely ravens in the death card, which has been renamed The Journey. And over the years, I've become less fond of renames just because I find sometimes they're an attempt to try and soften the experience. But actually, for me, firstly, the visual, there's nothing soft about it. Um, it's very real. It feels like quite an honest representation of the cycles of nature. And this is necessary, you know, a lot of the work that corvids and vultures do in terms of clean up alongside like a myriad of insects and other things is really important for the environment because it can stop diseases spreading and, and you know, more death from occurring. So I love this. But of course, ravens have kind of been this symbol over the years, traversing kind of every day to folklore, um, to occult symbols, to, you know, you name it, this kind of omen of death and what that means. Uh, so some really great imagery here. The journey card, perhaps my favourite death card ever as well. So there are quite a few faves in here. We've got balance with the two serpents. I feel like they come up again, but I can't remember. The Guardian, um, I'm trying to bring my brain back, is the Tower card. Sorry, this one is the Devil card. This is the Tower card, obviously. <laughs> Forgetting my numbers. And the Pole Star. So remember when we saw the wheel and we were talking about the journey through the wheel? The Pole Star is it the beginning point on one of the layers? I feel like it is. And so we've got the wanderer just going off into the entry of the woods. So we're starting our journey through the wheel, through the woods, through the pole star, which of course would just be the star in the other cards. And that's one of the first introductions into how two cards have a relationship in this particular deck. So we move them over there. The moon on water as opposed to just the moon. And then the sun. The sun of life, sorry. This is also one of the ones that is depicted in another card. So I'm going to put that to the side. And here we go. So we've got the great bear. So the devil is the guardian. And this is a bear skeleton. And it's like if you get through the the bones and the relationship that we have with the devil aspects inside of us, whether they're the more fun, beneficial, lusty kind of sensual ones, or whether it's those harder parts and those bits of our psyche that we struggle to acknowledge or whatever it is. Once we move through that and then we get through the moon and the sun and the tower and all of that crumbling that can come after the devil we get into the experience of judgment. We, we're welcomed by the, the entirety of the great bear in its original form. And I genuinely don't think that that's discussed. Um, I don't know. But that is this relationship that I built between these two, uh, probably about a year in to get in the deck whenever, back whenever I got it. And it was, it was good fun. And then we get to the world tree. So kind of a general discussion of the majors there because there's a lot of renaming going on and I just wanted to speak to that. And we've got a seasonal expression here from spring to summer to autumn to winter. Again, very northern hemisphere and here in particular because we are very fortunate to have these four obvious expressions visually of the seasons and I appreciate that some people don't experience the seasons like this. Uh, it might make the deck more fun for you but um, I don't know. 
So speaking as we go into the minors and we're going into the arrows, which, as we know, are the swords, relationships between cards and imagery. We've actually got, this is a horse. I can't remember what the horse is called again, but, you know, <laughs> that's okay. You can get into that part of it yourself. What's Like I said, what's interesting to me is the breath of life has this relationship with the sun of life, which, again, like, to me, that makes sense. But if all else fails, we're actually in the face of this horse, as far as I understand it, just the head of it. And it's just something that stood out to me as this, this wonderful occurrence that happens in cards that you wouldn't necessarily always pair up. And this is where we see keywords. Um, like I said, it comes away from traditional system structures quite a bit in some. Um, and even if you were going to try and read this through the, the lens of sort of numerology and all the fives mean this and all the sixes that this deck will throw you through a loop very very quickly so i would imagine that in terms of rider away smith because sometimes the tens are really one thing and sometimes they're really the other in that system it's perhaps a little less jarring in that lens but the key words, some of them are just, and the meaning and the visual are just realms apart. And some of them feel very familiar. Like to me, the two of swords, we often see two pathways. We often see a blindfold, two options. It has a justice-y kind of vibe to it, but it says injustice. So that makes sense. So although we're seeing a similar imagery, we're not necessarily being invited into the same discussion but it's a lot more familiar. So I'm going to pop. i got many sides, but I know what's going on. It's fine. Three of arrows, very, very three of swords. Another great example of it being more attuned to Rider Waite Smith in particular. Jealousy is actually a really interesting invitation, I think, because jealousy is much more about the thought process that then creates a feeling. And um, I like that because I know that the Three of Swords in the Rider Waite Smith can can throw people because it feels like a very emotive card. So much so that sometimes it's hard for people to see where the communication, mind, intellect aspect comes in. So I, I like that. I don't know. You have to let me know what you think. Um, but I feel like this deck speaks to some concepts of how I view the cards a lot clearer um, you know, a lot clearer, yeah, than others. The four, the four of swords, rest, again, well, I only need a few, but that's just an example. The five, frustration. I feel like at the moment most people would be like, okay, this is the Rider Waite Smith with a nuance. And then there's some moments, trust me, there's some moments. Seven of Arrows, Insecurity, with a kind of a green woman vibe going on here. Eight of Arrows, Struggle, and you see very wintry. And then Dedication for the Nine. Starting to come away from, you know, the Nine of Swords usually has a very nightmarish feel to it. Uh, although dedicating ourselves to something, the reality of that is a lot fucking harder than the than the concept of it uh, and mental dedication you know trying to have some form of mastery of the mind is is something that people have been trying to attain for freaking ages you know not just of the emotions but of the mind so I still feel like it's quite challenging but interestingly enough it looks kind of peaceful again not very ten of swords right away smith really interesting concept instruction especially if we think about for me it's the the idea of 10 as completion and going full circle is to then give everything you've taken from this suit back to someone else it doesn't have to be the next generation here this is why i saved the hooded the hooded man um because we've got the wren here and they specifically mention the wren 
So there's this relationship between them. And also you can see they're in the same uh, season. So they're both in a very wintry environment. And I often like to think of this as the wrens sort of turned around after. And they're looking at the conceiving the way through from this moment in time. Because there's a lot of thought process that goes into the hermit and that introverted period of time, right? That is a different expression to perhaps the the hanged one, or the, in this deck, the mirror. So for the sword suit, we've got the wren as the page, the hawk as the knight. I love the hawk for the knight. Raptors in particular with that kind of fast energy and um, the way that they hunt. Then we've got the swan for the queen. And then we've got the kingfisher for the king. So we're moving into the ace of bows now, spark of life. So what was the other one? Breath of life, that's it. So we had breath of life, now we've got spark of life. And I've put these in order in the way that it goes through the book as well. Um, just in case, just in case that was something you wanted to know. The two and the three are really interesting here. The two of bows decision, the three of bows fulfillment. It's like we're seeing from two different positions. This is the conception. And then this is what happens, I suppose, when we commit to it. But here we see those two serpents again. Four of bows celebration, another one that feels just, you know, four of wands. Yep. Here's our dude. Our dude was in another card in the majors do you remember and i said this is a thing but i can't remember what it is and it will 100 percent say in the book i wish i could remember where this was in the uk but i can't but i know that it is in the uk six of bows abundance not all of them look like they're moving through a set story but this really gives me that you know like the six of bows has the fire then the seven with a clearance, we've sort of moved away from, from the centre of the fire. Then we're back to it in the eight with a her fire. And then the nine, this looks like something they would have put together by it, but there's a walking away from it with respect. This is a very interesting nine of bows to me in terms of respect. I often think of the nine of wands as a kind of stamina so I suppose in terms of exerting boundaries to get to that point and the expression of will respect does have a big part of that what I will say for the keywords is I don't always pay attention to them and oh there's the fire in the distance by the way so this person's like trying to get there to perhaps build more of these structures or feed the fire more you see how it sort of took you through a little story in and around this campfire, even the four and the celebration. But yes, back to the keywords, I don't tend to let them dominate what I'm, what I'm doing with the cards. What I would say is to shy away from the keywords in a deck that is expressing its structure in a different capacity, unless you feel really comfortable just doing whatever the fuck you want to do with it. My experience is let the keywords help you. Like, let it be a guide. Because respect can mean something different on any given day. It it really can. And I think that trying to find, like, a set meaning for it just confines us anyway. To me, these are, like, very non, um, like non-invasive. They, they're not up in your face they're quite easy to ignore in the grand scheme of things and yet they're there as a guideline and I, I honestly feel like that was helpful for me when I can't remember when I got it I think it was 2017 but one of the things that I'm quite passionate about is I always talk about how I have a reading system that isn't system specific so it's infused by layers of the Rider Waite Smith it's infused by layers of numerology intuition way that I work in psychotherapy you know, and you, my cultural experience and all of those things that inform our tarot across the board. But also the reason that I have decks that are outside of the box, the reason that I have and enjoy looking at so much different artwork is to allow that artwork to 
guide um, and to be one of the informers and to have a relationship back and forth with the visual that I'm seeing. So I think that if you read like that or you're able to lean into that, then the way that this deck shifts away from one school of thought, you're going to have an easier time with it again in my experience. I don't want to say for everyone. So we've got Stoat for the page. I love, I love Stoat for a representation of anything to do with fire because these are, they're so quick. I mean, of course, I love Fox. Uh, I'm, I'm here to see Fox wherever it is. Um, it makes sense to me for the knight. The queen is standing on this kind of, it looks like a, a, a green man carving or something. But the queen is the hare. And then the king is the adder. And of course, well, I say of course, if you're not aware, the adder is the one venomous snake in England. I want to say the UK overall. And um, despite that, the, the issues of adders are long past. They're not aggressive at all. They will do it as a last result. And as far as I'm aware, it can be dealt with anyway. But yeah, it's interesting because we only have several snakes over here. And of all of them, the adder is the only one that's venomous. So a little bit of extra knowledge. We get into the vessel, so we move into the waters of life now. And you can see they're very elementally infused. And then the two of vessels, attraction, not my favourite keyword, but <laughs> I am I'm living for the stag and the horse. They are two animals that appear in a plethora of cards throughout, so I like that. And we've got the three here. I think that this is an interesting concept for Joy because it also reminds me of when they squabble. Um, but I suppose too much Joy, you know, too much of a good thing. It's an interesting invitation. This is one of the ones that leaves me thinking of, and I probably didn't even need to leave this out. This makes me think of the Rider Waite Smith more than anything else because I don't solely associate the Four of Cups with boredom. It's too isolated for me. But that's what I said. You can kind of ignore the words, breathe into them what you want. But between this and the Four of Arrows, I feel like there's been a lot of cards that feel very Rider Waite Smith. And then here we go. Five of Vessels, Five of Cups, Ecstasy. Completely the opposite of what we're used to seeing if we're talking about a more Rider Waite Smith expression. This is where you get a few cards that really throw people through the ringer, like I said. And I think that that's why it's a glorious invitation to just trust the deck and not try and regurgitate upon it what, you know, what we already might have in place for that five. I like to follow that invitation and receive those different layers. And I'll have often come to a deck because I felt it calling to me. So then if I'm pulling the five of vessels from this, I'm meant to get this iteration of it and not another one, if that makes sense. But I think that there's a lot of a... I'm going to move these ones now. There's a lot of emotional ties for me in general in this deck. But yeah, this to me is this is what I'm used to. And it has that that real kind of familiarity. It heavily interweaves the experience that I have with the land. Um, sometimes it feels like it even speaks to some of the kind of land spirits that I commune with, seeing the seasons, seeing the animals. Like I'm very lucky that I have all of these connective ties to this deck in particular. So I, I do acknowledge that for me, there's a, there's a big luxury to this deck. It's definitely why it's often been, um, if not always, in my top 10, you know, top 10 this, top 10 that. It often is in there. It's not one that I would part with. It's a very good representation, although it's not modern. And um, when I say representation, I'm really not focusing on the people because both the era of the people and just what they look like visually, the ones that do look like people, aren't necessarily my everyday experience. Carry on flipping through them, sorry. 
I nearly lost my train of thought. Yes, the people that I do see, it's, it's far more diverse than this. But in terms of the land, and this is how I think of this deck, I don't often think about these people at all. I think about the animals, I think about the land. I'm sure there's a privilege to not thinking about the people in this deck as well. So I'm not going to deny that. But it doesn't feel people heavy to me in the way that, say, perhaps the Druid craft does. And it's probably that mix between there's some that have got the heads of animals and then we've got animals as cults not people it's so one of the things i forgot to say is that they do still lean into their element so whilst the swan in the um the swords was also on the water there is an interesting uh discussion between water and mirror and then thought um and communication anyway but aside from that of course they're feathered, they they can take flight, etc. And here we've got animals that embody or live within the the water. So the otter, both land and water, we've got the eel, we've got the salmon, and then the heron. So we do have another bird, but like I said, um these are ones that are going to spend a lot of time in the water. I enjoy the heron for that kind of having um, having emotional embodiment in a way that is um, empathic but contained. And then we get to the foundation of life. So we've moved through. So we're in the pentacles and the final suit. Look at these. If you've ever seen hares doing this, then you know, oof, challenge is definitely the word for it. I think that mostly this is a deck that I, like I said, feels like a take the people away from it. And it feels like a very solid representation of many layers of my practice. Um, and whilst there's no obvious witchcraft and I'm using that as like a it's kind of a cheeky poke at how people discuss it really you know I do obviously have a a lovely altar space and a glorious place to look at but a lot of my craft happens away from that as well and I feel like this is a representation of that and some of just the dream work or spirit visualization journey stuff that I do as well um, I love one of the green green people, I'm going to say. I don't care which one they are. Doing the healing here in this card. And then look, there's this healing taking place. And the, the, the land behind looks really kind of barren as well and burnt. And then after this, the same person is back whittling away and back to finessing their craft and their tools and stuff, which is very cool. The nine of stones for tradition. Oh, I love this. And they've got an adder. I mean, I'm assuming that's a pretty pissed off adder, but <laughs> nice symbolism being as it's not real and it's just artwork. This is, a, this is what this deck makes me feel like. It's a deck that feels like home to me. Maybe it's not the most fleshed out representation and it certainly isn't the best representation of people to me, but certainly the things that I think about in the countryside and the things that call me deep down in my core, the things that I'm drawn to in the land, the animals, you know, sometimes I look at these cards and like I said, I'm quite a... Uh, I'm quite fortunate to be very visual but very sense-based so I can almost hear the birds twittering away in the background when I look at this picture and it does it feels like a coming home so I'm I'm particularly passionate about this deck because it's had such an impactful experience in my practice um, and we finally get into the pentacles. So we've got the page, which is the links. And obviously we've seen the links in the the strength card as well. We've got the knight, which is the horse. I love that they are very clearly a wild horse as well. Then we've got the queen as the bear. 
And then finally the king, and that's the wolf. And I've shown you the backs already. That is my very long, very, very rambly discussion of the wild wood. Sometimes it's hard to, to not get distracted by the cards as I'm going through. <laughs> Uh, and talk about them as opposed to my experience but I, I feel like I've shared quite a bit with you actually about my experience of this deck and the the ways that I use it are not just isolated to traditional tarot reading you know having a question coming to the cards and drawing from them I will be most inclined with this deck aside from reading to also incorporate it into rituals to also incorporate it into journey work to also pull cards from it that I want to see and have them out on my altar which is something you'll probably see me do more of this year because I didn't use this very much in 2022 and it's not because I don't love it it's because I have quite the fleshy collection and uh, <laughs> I was being with other decks this is like I say one that kind of has a lot more meaning to it for me. Some of my decks are for tarot and that's it. And that's cool. Um, I don't mind that. But this one, I think the journey work and the visualisation and all of that really compelled me to do some more with it. And because it has been on a few trips with me just locally and stuff like that. Yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty damn bonded. So... I hope that that gave you an insight into the deck for those of you who specifically requested this as well. It was long, I know, but I think strap in and get used to it because my reviews are kind of long and I feel like people are welcoming a bit more long form now after having such short form stuff kind of thrust in our faces for a while. It's fun short form, I'm not anti it, but I feel like it's helped people realise that Sometimes it's nice to just sit and be with something rather than have lots of information about everything all at once. So my reviews won't be for everyone, but there you go. I have finished it. I welcome you to ask any questions that you want to ask in the comments below. And I'll be back soon with another video. Bye.